The streets of New York City erupted in chaos on November 10, 2016. In front of the Trump Tower and beyond, rioters were busy protesting Donald Trump's recently announced victory in the US presidential race. Streets filled restlessly with traffic or became closed off entirely. In the most extreme cases, city blocks even transformed into mini battlefields, where supporters clashed with protesters verbally and physically over the sounds of police cars called in to quell the mayhem. And then, somewhere mixed in the cacophony of New York City's streets was peace and quiet. Two young men and a game, chess. With the uproar going on outside, the silence this dim lit room offered was as serene as it was surprising. One almost wouldn't be able to guess that a crowd of hundreds sat in the dark to watch these two illuminated men bounce wooden pieces across 64 Chayascuro squares. Their hands seemed to move with inner alacrity and enigmatic purpose that captivated the eyes of not just the silhouetted crowd, but a growing online crowd of millions. Therefore, the conflict going on outside seemed nowhere near the strange importance of the complex and bloody war that these two men were engaging in. Around 600 million people play this ancient game of fictitious war today, and out of those many million, only the top 30 can make a living off of it. And out of that minuscule slice of players, only two were allowed to sit down at this small, seemingly ordinary table and compete for the title of world champion. These two men are Magnus Carlsen of Norway and Sergei Karyakin of Russia. The match will be a best of 12 games, with tiebreaks added if necessary. At stake are over $1 million and the monumental title and prestige of world champion. These two young men have worked assiduously their whole lives to be here. Let's see how they fare. I hope you are ready for one of the most tense and dramatic days in chess history. An unspoken rule of spectator chess is that you are to remain silent at all times. After all, it's only polite to let the players have their peace of mind while waging mental warfare with one another. But after only two moves, Magnus sends a wave of laughter over the otherwise silent crowd. In one of the most important games in his life, he has chosen to open with the competitively uncommon Trumpowski attack. He started out with the Trumpowski. A name that purposefully resonates with the new president-elect. Magnus may be inside this room, but he isn't oblivious of what's going on outside. When these two powerhouses of the game play, more often than not, there ends up being no decisive outcome. Out of the 21 games they have previously played in tournament together, Magnus has all but 4 wins, while Sergei has 1. The other 16 have all been grueling draws. After 42 moves, with only one major piece apiece, the two decide to add another draw to the board. The 55th World Championship starts rather undecidedly. While chess has been enjoyed by people for one and a half millennia, World Championship chess has only been around for one and a half centuries. The first showdown occurred in New York City in 1866, where the two leading players at the time, Wilhelm Steinitz and Johannes Sukatort, played for the first ever title of World Champion. In this hard-fought match, Steinitz came back from a 1-4 deficit to win the World Championship title 10-5, in perhaps the most thoroughgoing reversal of fortune in the history of World Championship play. It was a dramatic start to the legacy that is World Championship Chess, and it highlighted the trend. Over 40% of World Championship matches have witnessed the winner coming back from behind to win it all, and it's in these impressive comebacks that the true brilliance of chess and the ruthless determination of its players can be put on display for the world to see. For example, Juve vs. Alakine in 1935, where after Game 7, Juve was down 1-4 but clawed his way back in a 30-game set to ultimately win the World Championship title 9-8. Another famous example is Fischer vs. Spassky in 1972. With Cold War tensions rising, it seemed as if the whole world was watching these two men symbolically compete. Fischer trailed behind early on, 0-2, but his grit did not diminish, and after the 21-game marathon match, Fischer found himself up 7-3. This win would make Bobby Fischer the first and only US-born world chess champion, and would be the tiny yet massively monolithic stain to an otherwise flawless Soviet Union control of the world title in the second half of the 20th century. But perhaps the most impressive comeback in all of chess championship history is one that occurs over the span of not one championship match, but two. Welcome to the insanity that is Kasparov vs Karpov. 
1984, these two men were about to play the longest world championship match in chess history, due to one seemingly insignificant fact. Instead of being a best of format, Kasparov vs Karpov was a first two format. Whoever scored six wins first would be the world champion. Innocent sounding enough. And it looked to be that way when the reigning world champion, Karpov, got off to a strong lead early on, being up 4-0 by the end of the first nine games. It seemed to the world that the experienced Karpov would get a fast and clean 6-0 sweep versus the young newcomer Kasparov. But then, the next game was a draw, and then the next, and the next, and the next. In fact, the next 17 games were draws, and then a worn out Karpov, who had lost 20 pounds due to the mental strain of 17 grueling draws in a row, finally got his fifth win. Only one more win for him, and this marathon of a match would be over. But the youthful Kasparov had different plans. Four more draws later, in game 32, a number that only one other world championship had seen, Kasparov achieved his first win. And then, after 14 more mind-numbing, soul-crushing draws, Kasparov got his second win. And then, in the very next game, his third. By this time, the championship had stretched 48 games long. Hundreds of hours of competitive chess had been rattled off in mere weeks. Due to a lack of physical and an excess of mental exercise, each player's health, even Kasparov's, was sinking perilously into danger. And so, the FIDE president said that there was a thing as too much, and against both players' adamant wishes, cancelled the entire tournament. 48 games gone, crushed, erased in the blink of an eye. The match was to be replayed the following year, and this time, and all times to come afterwards, the championship would have a set limit of games. 24 to be exact, half the length of their previous world championship match. After game 5, Kasparov was again down, this time by a 2-1 deficit, but his resolve did not break. During game 16, Kasparov takes the advantage outright in perhaps the most stunning way possible, practically forcing Karpov to sacrifice their queen for the small price of his knight. After the 24 games were up, Kasparov found himself the victor 5-3. The young 22-year-old had dethroned the 10-year reigning world champion, and it only took a combined and mind-boggling 72 games to achieve. Riots are still going on in Trump's home city as the two sit down to play game two. Sergei opens with one of the most popular openings in chess, the Roy Lopez. Named after the 16th century Spanish bishop Rodrigo López de Segura, this opening line tends to lead to an indecisive outcome rather than a win. It's clear early on that Sergei intends to play safe defense against Magnus. After the opening, the middle game shows a completely symmetrical kingside, a telltale sign that a draw is incoming. After a couple more moves, both men agree to draw. While game 2 can be written off as a rather lackluster draw, game 3 was anything but. Around 7% of Norway's entire population was staying up to watch their national hero, so when Magnus receives the white pieces for Game 3, he decides to put on a show for his countrymen. Game 3 starts with the classic Roy Lopez opening, but this one deviates from the norm as a few moves later Magnus finds his kingside rook in the middle of a barren chessboard. Once Sergei places a target on its back, instead of playing the much more standard move rook back to e1, he goes to e2, blocking his bishop and queen diagonals. Well, it's still, uh, actually, rook e2 is a very rare line. It is some small surprise already for Karyakin, I think. And here's the funny thing. Magnus will move it back to e1 on the very next move. So why the e2 intermission? Well, it served no other purpose than to provoke Sergei to play b6. So that sort of forces Black's hand into playing b6, uh, which threatens bishop a6. Bishop a6 would lead to a bunch of trades and, and a peaceful result. But as I said, this game gets exciting. Now Carlson plays rook e1. So he just literally played rookie two to induce b6 and then rookie one, are you serious, right? But his point is, he, he believes that b6 is a long, in the long term is a move Black wishes he could have back. Sergei takes the bait and in the long run, this move, unknown to practically anyone but Magnus, will weaken Sergei's position over time. Later on, looking to put pressure on Magnus to swing the tide of the game, Sergei actually commits his first big mistake. But it was in this moment where Karyakin kind of struggled and decided he needed aggressive counterplay to deal with the fact that he was losing the pawn. Here, if Karyakin played, for example, d5, he's got a very solid pawn structure. But Karyakin played a, what, to my eyes, is a very uncharacteristic move for him. And he played c5. This move is now leading to a series of force moves that end up giving Carlson an extra pawn advantage. The move makes sense on paper. Sergei has a bishop to Magnus's knight, and usually bishops do better with less pawns on the board, while knights will do better with more. 
If Magnus takes the pawn, Sergei will simply capture with his bishop, and the position will be more open for his bishop to roam around and stalk potential prey. But Magnus knows this, and doesn't come close to biting. Instead, he slides his rook deep down into enemy territory. Sergei is forced to defend with the king, leaving his most valuable pawn, the f-pawn, unprotected. Magnus slides his rook back, freeing up his knight to take Sergei's precious pawn. Now, Sergei's pawns are all weakly isolated, and he has no choice but to play the prophylactic, suicidal, and yet correct move, d3. It's a free pawn on a silver platter for Magnus, and while it does isolate his pawns too, like a shark in the water, he now smells blood. At this point, six whole hours have flown by, and time, which has pressured both players to make questionable moves, is dizzyingly slipping away. Sergei takes one of Magnus's pawns he strangely left undefended, but it was just bait for a beautiful trap concocted by Magnus. For the small price of one pawn, Magnus will, to the commentator's shock, win Sergei's bishop. The, the bishop's hanging, and there's gotta be a win here. But afterwards, Magnus finds his pieces congested, and Sergei's king suddenly attacks his rook, his knight, and his pawn simultaneously. Magnus can only save two out of the three, and decides to leave his pawn undefended. It's what Sergei wants. If he can somehow manage to take both of Magnus's pawns, it's a theoretical and quite simple draw. But instead of taking the defenseless pawn right away, Sergei should attack Magnus's knight with his rook. The B pawn should not be captured, and the F pawn should not be captured either. That too is poison. He panics though and takes the pawn right away. And now Magnus can capitalize on a once again losing position for Black. But right after Sergei's incorrect play, Magnus makes one of his own. Instead of moving his rook to control the board better, Magnus moves his knight to the edge of the board to defend his own pawn. Sergei, now with room to breathe, takes over the back rank with his own rook. There are still winning lines for Magnus, but his very next move, move 72, erases all of them. Instead of putting pressure on Sergei's king with check, Magnus makes the much more human and unfortunately incorrect move of attacking a somewhat useless pawn. Yes, it defends b3, and yes, he ensured that he was going to win the b-pawn, but here's what he missed. After rook to b7, we're not pushing h3. We're playing rook a1 first, exclam. The commentators were pulling their hair out. Somehow, Sergei would survive, and on move 78, both men agreed to a draw. Fide would go so far as to call it a draw for the ages. Magnus had Sergei locked up, but like a bashful Houdini, he broke free. During this game, Magnus frequented the private room where he would rest his tired face into his palms, looking defeated and lost. Unbeknownst to him, the spectacle was broadcasted live by hitting cameras in the private sector. His home countrymen could see firsthand his dejection as he let the biggest win opportunity he's had so far slip away. Magnus would have the cameras banned and removed the next day. Yeah, I wasn't really aware of that, so... Uh, Magnus, the computer says you have quite a few good chances today. Uh, are you afraid of what you're going to find when you go through this game? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the pressure both these players feel increases tenfold when you put into the context that they sacrificed practically their entire lives up to this point to be here. All these men knew was chess. They had no choice. Any other option would result in them not sitting where they were today. You have to dedicate your whole life to chess if you are to make it and both dutifully did, sacrificing their entire childhoods, their entire teens, their early 20s too, to be here. To sit where they are sitting today, the pricelessness of youth must be sacrificed. But something else was gained, something only a select few in the billions of people on this planet will ever know, the rare feeling of being the absolute and undisputed best. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had really worn them about the same. And both that morning <laughs> equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day.
Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Born in Semferopol, Ukraine, in a tiny three-room apartment cramped with his extended family, Sergei Karyakin started learning chess when he was five years old. His dad noticed Sergei watching chess on TV, and he soon bought a chess set out so the two could play together. And Sergei quickly demonstrated an ability so monstrous, methodical, and apparent that later that year, he would be the one playing chess on TV. His father realized he had a prodigy on his hands and decided to walk his young son down a road less traveled. When he was not even a teen, Sergei dropped out of standard schooling to attend a chess school no more than 100 meters away from where he lived. For 9 hours a day, all of Sergei's focus willfully poured into the same 64 black and white squares. Soon, his talents echoed throughout Ukraine and Alexander Mamat, head of the famed Mamat Chess Club, invited Sergei to study at his school. With its enticing track record, his entire family moved cross-country just so he could attend. <laughs> Это уже было поставлено на то, чтобы переехать, чтобы он уже стал чемпионом мира. Сергей continued to play his part and sacrificed his precious youth at the chess club. At 13, he boasted that he could win the world championship at age 16. Suspiciously reminiscent of the young boy Beth Harmon plays in the Netflix miniseries The Queen's Gambit. I will be world champion one day. When? In three years. You'll be 16 in three years. There's no doubt that with Sergei's ability, his dream wasn't as far-fetched as it sounded. But unfortunately, fate threw a wrench in his plans. The director of the school suddenly died, and the school indefinitely shut down. Just like that, their family had no choice but to move back to Simferopol and sell whatever they could on the street to make ends meet, as his father's cook wages were not enough to support the entire family. When, when we came back to Simferopol, I was 13 years old, and starting from, from 13 to 19 years old, I didn't have any support, uh, again, just completely nothing. There was no money left over for coaching or training. There were no sponsors. There was nothing. The young boy had nothing but poverty and his chessboard. Game 4 was a 6-hour, 94-move draw. At the beginning, Magnus gained a slight advantage, but 44 moves in, he loses that advantage outright by playing a move he incorrectly considered to be a force to win. Sergei, to Magnus's surprise, counterplayed perfectly with his bishop. All right, Magnus, what's your reaction to this ending in a draw? Uh, it's disappointing for sure, um, but you know, I'll try try again next time. For game five, instead of the standard Roy Lopez, Magnus chooses a very uncommon opening for him, the Italian, hoping to catch Sergei and his team off guard. But if anything, it was Sergei who had the slight advantage after this more flexible and dynamic opening. Karyakin instantly smelt blood. It didn't help Magnus's case that late into the middle game, he blunders on the 41st move. Instead of sliding his rook to start an attack on Sergei's king, he blocked it outright by retreating his own king to g2. For the first time in the entire match, a winning line was available to Sergei. All he needed to do was find it. But the path to victory seen by the computers was mind-meltingly complex. And 10 moves later, Sergei saw that he couldn't transform his advantage into a solid win. He agreed to accept yet another draw. But unlike the previous draws, this time it was on Sergei's terms. While Magnus in 2004 was the second youngest player in history to receive the prestigious title of Grand Master, Sergei Karyakin, right before his support evaporated in 2003, at 12 years and 7 months old, became the outright youngest. There are thousands of grandmasters of chess, and he beat them all, including Magnus, to it. With this accomplishment, he was not about to stop walking on the path less traveled. Although he didn't become world champion at 16, in April 2005, Sergei broke into the top 100 chess players. And despite being alone in his efforts, he kept rising from there. At 19 years old, Sergei found himself 13th in the world. It was enough for Ukraine's neighbor, Russia 
to take notice of Sergei. While the Ukrainian government rejected pleas from Sergei and his family to support his chess talents, the Russian Chess Federation welcomed him with open arms. In 2009, they offered to financially support him and his entire family. All he had to do was renounce his Ukrainian citizenship and move to Moscow. Sergei's life was chess and his family, so it's no surprise that he eagerly agreed. Playing with the Russian flag, Sergei in 2012 outplaced Magnus Carlsen by a whole point to dominate the World Rapid Chess Championship and become, for the first time ever, a world champion. While not as prestigious as the well-known Classical World Championship, it was a huge win for Sergei and Russia. But it wasn't just on the chessboard that Sergei showed his support and admiration for his new home country. In 2014, Russia invaded and annexed the Crimean Peninsula, Sergei's birthplace from Ukraine, and in doing so would start the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian War. Sergei from day one expressed his patriotic support for Russia moving forward. His stances would become so strong that Sergei would later be kicked out of attending half a year of FIDE chess tournaments in 2022. And early on, his staunch views were enough to alienate him from many of his old Ukrainian chess friends and coaches, who didn't really know what to say to their once friend. Since like, uh, Russia annexed Crimea, suddenly he started to be like, so pro Putin supporters for Russ in Ukraine is a little bit I don't, not understandable mm. because you spent so much time in Ukraine like uh, we were like many years like friends if you are make such a statement in some aspects you I think you also support uh, this kind of war this kind of aggression which is I think not good but okay, I mean, the life continues. Uh, well, uh, maybe if, if it's possible, I, I don't want to speak t too much about it before the, before the match. Okay. Can we, do, can we just... Yeah, if play? you don't want to, yeah, yeah. it's okay. It's yeah. totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Sergei didn't care. Russia stepped in as the young man's savior when he needed it the most, and he would give his all to pay it back. This was the path less traveled. This would make all the difference. The halfway game wasn't drawn out and it wasn't necessarily hard fought either. After just 32 moves and a little less than two hours of play, both men, like tired boxers in the ring, agreed to end it there. When are you expecting your first win? <laughs> if you only knew. Spectators got to take the evening off, and more importantly, so did the players. It was clear they both needed it, as the Karpov vs. Kasparov World Championship match echoed in the minds of spectators, commentators, and players alike. Russia had, besides the aforementioned Bobby Fischer, flawlessly dominated the second half of the 20th century with classical chess world champions, and Russia saw Sergei as their next chance to continue their dominance. In 2015, Sergei entered the Chess World Cup, a tournament that would allow the winner a spot in next year's candidates tournament, the tournament that decides who will face the reigning world champion that year. Even though the field was filled with some of the finest chess players the world had ever seen, Sergei, seated 11th, won the whole tournament outright, punching his ticket to the candidates with ease. But the candidates was a whole different ballpark. Over half of the eight-man field was ranked in the top 10. Sergei, 13th in the world, was the second lowest ranked player that year. But he was about to shock the world again with one of the most monstrous runs in candidates tournament history. To start, he would beat the five-time US champion, Hikaru Nakamura, ranked third out of the eight-man crew. Then he beat the former five-time world champion, Vishy Anand. Now, the only thing standing in his way for a chance to face Magnus was Fabiano Caruana, the highest ranked player out of the eight-man crew, and the third ranked player in the entire world. Growing up in Brooklyn, he would have been a hometown hero for New York to root for during the World Championships. But on the 42nd move, Caruana went for a win with a risky rook move, and then Sergei stunned experts and counterattacked perfectly. Four moves later, Fabiano had no choice but to resign. I'm probably the happiest person in the world at this moment. 
for years, Sergei was stuck at 13th, and then in one single tournament, he broke through to the top 10 to become 8th in the world. And he was determined to keep that momentum up and become the first Russian world champion since Kramnik in 2007. All that was in his way now was the reigning world champion, Magnus Carlsen. In front of one of the larger crowds that match, due to it being a weekend and New York school districts giving out free tickets to kids, another draw was yet to ensue. Fabiano, the person who was so close to being in Sergei's spot had he not lost to him, called the draw early on. After 33 moves and two and a half hours of play, his calculated prediction had come true. Now, the match was about to tie the record for the longest starting string of draws in all of World Chess Championship history. In 1995, Kasparov vs. Anand played on the observation deck of the 107th floor of the World Trade Center, where perhaps the views were so pretty that the players took their time to draw blood, as it took 9 games for someone to finally win. Magnus didn't have views to entertain him however, and the reigning world champion was losing his composure draw after draw, a stark difference from anything he had exhibited before. It's disappointing for sure. You know, I'll try and try again next time. Like Sergei, Magnus's journey into the world of chess started when he was very young. At the age of six, Magnus had memorized all of the flags and capitals of every country in the world by himself. It was enough for Henrik, Magnus's father and a former tournament chess player himself, to encourage his son to explore chess next. Magnus quickly grasped the intricacies of play, and it became apparent that he had a natural talent for the strategic and analytical aspects of the game. Before he was even 10, Magnus was beating his father consistently, and playing for multiple hours a day. Most days, Henrik would have to tear him away from the chessboard to let him get some sleep. By 2004, at only 13 years of age, he was already being called the Mozart of chess, a title given to him by chess writer and pro player himself, Lubomir Kavalik, after playing exceptionally well in a rapid tournament. Magnus, playing a rook behind, found a beautiful checkmate against Spike Ernst, trapping Ernst's king against its own two rooks. But the Mozart of chess was just getting started. Later that year, Magnus beat Karpov, the reigning world champion from 1975 to 85, and the person who preceded the legendary Bobby Fischer as world champion. Then he faced the man who dethroned Karpov in the infamous 72 game marathon, Garry Kasparov. Magnus was ranked in the 700s. Kasparov was still number one. After Kasparov showed up half an hour late, he sat down to face his youngest opponent ever. Quickly into the game, Magnus can be seen strolling around while Kasparov stays sitting, pondering heavily about his next move. As soon as Kasparov moves, Magnus instantly retaliates and continues to watch the other games. This practically aloof behavior visibly shakes Kasparov up. How could a 13 year old have so much confidence against the world's number one? They end up unbelievably drawing. Magnus would end that year by receiving his biggest sponsor yet, Microsoft, and being awarded the title of Chess Grandmaster, the second youngest in history at that point behind Sergei. Fast forward through the years and exceptional wins. In 2013, Time Magazine names Magnus Carlsen one of the most influential people ever. And in his introduction, Kasparov is quoted saying, we will soon be living in the Carlsen era. In his famous 60 Minutes interview, Magnus can be seen playing an exhibition match against 10 Harvard lawyers simultaneously, while blindfolded. Magnus won each game handily, keeping track of 320 pieces on 10 separate boards all in his head. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Do you have any idea how extraordinary this looks to... No, it's uh, one of the amazing things in chess that you can, you can, you don't really need a board, you can just keep but it. But it transcends chess, I mean, I just, uh, I, I just can't fathom what you've just done, it's just, it seems like it's supernatural. Magnus chose the path less traveled, and it made him exceptionally and brilliantly different. Then, the world championships came into the picture. Kasparov, who won the world title in 1985, after playing 72 games against Karpov, would end up retaining his world championship title up until the end of the 20th century, before losing it to fellow Russian Vladimir Kramnik in 2000. Kramnik, after a seven-year reign, would then lose his title to Vishyanam, India's first ever Grand Master, in 2007. A five-time champion, Vishy would hold the title up until 2013, when a young 20-something Magnus Carlsen came into the world championship equation. Commentators during this match exclaimed that although Magnus recently became the world ranked number one, he had little to no chance of winning, 
In fact, his quest was similar to climbing Mount Everest with tennis shoes and no oxygen. When it came to championship matches, Vichy was fiendishly gifted. He had beaten higher rated opponents before to retain his title. And when it came to the two's head-to-head -head record, Vichy had Magnus beat 6-3. This was just another cakewalk for Vichy and Anand. Or at least it was supposed to be. In the coming weeks, Magnus defeated Vichy in a flawless Frio fashion to become the 16th ever world chess champion. Vichy came back the next year in the 2014 candidates, just barely outplacing another young 20-something, Sergei Karyakin, for a chance to reclaim his title. But Magnus had gotten even stronger that year, stronger than anyone could have predicted, receiving the highest ELO rating ever in chess history at 2882. The 16th champion was an unstoppable force, and Vichy simply didn't stand a chance. There were even times when it looked too easy for the defender. Ways to improve along the way. And some of those... That's interesting. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was gonna... Not, he's cut. not sleeping. No, he's obviously not sleeping, but... Magnus would win 3-1. Later that year, he would win the Blitz and Rapid World Chess Championships too, and become the first player to hold all three World Championship titles at once. Magnus made chess his life's path, and it rewarded him profoundly. But now, he was playing his toughest challenger yet, an opponent who had equally dedicated his whole life to chess, but had not seen it rewarded as equally. Sergei Karyakin was hungry to see the roles reversed. After seven drawn out and bloodless draws, Magnus decides it's time to strike, no matter the risk. He opened with the Kali Zuckertort system of white and the advantage between the two players became an oscillating pendulum. All along the way, there were ample draw routes available for Magnus, but every time it was his turn to move, he would take the path less traveled, less studied, and less sure. Here, there's potential for danger here. So, Carlson should probably take notice of this and play one of the three moves the engine is actually recommending. Queen e2, knight e2, h3, get rid of this knight, this probably makes the most sense. But Carlson was ready to be aggressive, he wanted the game to get nuts, he wanted the game to be mixed up so that he could really get his winning chances that he's so long desired. And so he played the move knight to b5. It's amazing that knight to b5 was, was played at such a high level match. And it was a risky, delicate, and enigmatic path that could produce a resounding win, but at the cost of being more open to attack than he ever had before. In classical chess, each player for the first 40 moves is assigned 100 minutes of play time, plus an additional 30 seconds after each move is made, coming out to 3 minutes per move. Due to the complex nature of the game, both players were teetering on that 3 minute edge, jostling their pieces for any slight advantage. Time was running out and threatening to take out both players, as it slowly slipped its invisible hands around each of their necks. Around the 30 move mark, there were more moves than minutes for each player. Carlsen ran from any attempt at a draw like the plague and danced Sergei quickly into a self-made dark inferno, trying to push him in while he himself leaned dangerously close. So close that the blistering heat became unbearable. And then Magnus slipped. Instead of pushing Sergei in, a rushed blunder on the 34th move acted as the rocky ground that stole his footing right from under him. Carlson didn't do that though, he didn't play rook d7, and he didn't play the other move the computer seems to be liking, which is knight e5. Carlson was, he was not to be deterred from the most aggressive and risky way to play this position. Perhaps playing those two blacks and getting those draws really affected his, his psychological stance on the match, because now he played a move that, regardless of how long we've been letting the computer think, still is not in the top three, because it's just a horrible, horrible move. In this position, Carlson played c5 sacrificing a pawn and letting Black's potential initiative start to run wild with it. And now, Sergei could puppeteer an unsteady Magnus right where he wanted. Sergei traded rooks, and the aftermath allowed him to take an extra pawn from Magnus. And during the endgame, every pawn counts. Sergei had six to Magnus's four, and those extra two both had a clear path to coronation at the end of the board. Consequently, it was looking like the end of Magnus. But there was one catch. Sergei had exactly one minute left on his clock to take advantage of it. The pressure was mounting. He had Magnus falling into the hot ashy demise, but the flame was running out. There was a solution, however. Make it to move 40, where both players are granted an additional lifeline of 50 minutes. Sergei needed those 50 extra minutes desperately to study the board and fully take control of the situation, but they were behind a wall of five gargantuan moves. It was dizzying play at that point. Like a submarine sailor holding a flickering candle, he had to act fast. 
First, he hastily tried to make the endgame even more decisive by offering Magnus a queen trade. Of course, if Magnus were to accept, Sergei would be rewarded handsomely with a decisive win. But precisely because of that reason, Magnus declines, and he does so in the most ingenious way possible, with a knight sacrifice. Because the knight places Sergei's king in check, his queen suddenly becomes paralyzed, and although Sergei wins over Magnus's knight in exchange for a pawn, a couple moves later, Magnus is able to take one of Sergei's knights, and then his last extra pawn too, thus equalizing a game that was almost certainly in Sergei's hands. And then, all at once, the two submerged from the sea with gasping lungs, breathing in the fresh air of an extra 50 minutes. Sergei's ocean of an advantage had somehow waned away, and it looked to be yet another draw. Eventually, Magnus even finds himself a pawn up, and the game is looking good for the reigning world champion. Until the 50-second move, where Magnus, with many good options available to him, chooses the absolute worst. And I mean the absolute worst. Welcome to the blunder that is H4. Matches will come with brilliant moves and not so brilliant moves too. It's part of the human condition. Mistakes will always be made. The worst blunder in chess championship history was made in the 1892 World Championship. Chagorin was behind 8 wins to 9 going into the final game. But lucky for him, after playing an aggressive early and middle game, he found himself a piece up with a pretty much guaranteed win ahead of him. You're in a must-win situation. White has an extra piece and should win. But instead of that, Chigorin made an extraordinary blunder. Bishop b4 attacking a rook. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was still playing quick moves. Maybe he didn't realize he'd reached the time control. Anyway, unfortunately, Bishop b4 allows rook takes h2. And here, Chigorin resigned because Steinitz would deliver checkmate, the classic two rooks on the seventh checkmate. After a grueling 24 game match, Chigorin narrowly lost 8 to 10. While not as bad as Chagorin's mistake, still stubborn to play for the win, Magnus makes the overly aggressive pawn to h4 move. This move is suicidal for two reasons. First, it slows down the pressure applied to Sergei's a-file pawn, which is creeping closer and closer to the end of the board. To many of us, this position seems recoverable. Just simply take the pawn with your queen. But it's actually not as simple as that, due to the second crucial weakness of h4. Sergei's knight now has access to perhaps the most valuable square of the board at the moment g4. This move will put Magnus's king in a terrifying check, because after moving his king out of danger, Sergei can mobilize his own queen into the attack, applying an insane amount of pressure. Any line from this point onwards results in Magnus having to sacrifice his own queen, or finding himself checkmated outright. Therefore, h4, a seemingly innocuous pawn move, has sealed Magnus's fate. He won't play another move that game but it doesn't stop him from spending 1 minute and 48 seconds desperately looking for a way to undo what is already sealed in the 64 squares before him. He has devoted his whole life up to this point protecting a wooden king no bigger than his thumb. He had worked his way up year after year to become the person with the most protected king of all time. And now, there was nothing. There was no way forward. The board presented a stubborn Sisyphus boulder that would never succumb to Magnus's will, no matter how hard he pushed. Magnus has no choice but to resign, and in that moment, he becomes the most dejected human being on the entire planet. If it weren't for his father, based on eyewitness accounts, behind the thick pane of mirrored soundproof glass sat a shivering Henrik Carlsen, looking onward at his hopeless son, soul crushed knowing there was nothing he could do to help. His father had been to practically every one of his son's tournaments even taking a year off to travel with his teenage son so he could play the world's best. Magnus says he wouldn't be able to tolerate this life if it weren't for his father, who's always there for him. When you travel with Magnus, what's your role? I'm a servant. But even now, after all his son had accomplished, he still became paralyzed, mentally imploding at the thought of not being able to help his own son when help was needed the most. For the first time in Magnus's World Championship history, he is trailing behind. Before players make it to the official press conference, reporters from other news outlets have an opportunity to stop players and ask questions. Usually both players would give quick responses and be on their way to the press room. But on this occasion, Magnus didn't say a word, while Sergei happily answered questions about how it was like to win his first game of the match against the world champion. 
The result was, Magnus showed up early to the press room, before the host speaker even showed up. Both players are required by contract to attend post-game press conferences. If a player were to forego a post-game press conference, a hefty 10% of the $1.1 million prize pool would be forfeited. This would result in a loss that would be over what most of the best professional chess players make in a year. Magnus, exhausted and dejected and alone, camera clicks by the hundreds, decided to go with the wind and not give a damn. That press conference would only feature Sergei, who with his win of Game 8 simply needed to tie four more times with Magnus to become the world champion. Wilhelm Steinitz, the player who came back from a 1-4 deficit to win the first ever World Chess Championship, lived peacefully as he reigned champion for the next eight years. But like all kingdoms, Steinitz's reign would inevitably crumble. In 1894, he would lose his title 5-10 to Emanuel Lasker, who was 32 years his junior. Steinitz spent the next three years in preparation to win his title back. But when the rematch happened in 1897, Lasker destroyed him even more thoroughly at 2-10. After such a crushing loss, Steinitz's whole psyche just cracked. Shortly after, he became institutionalized in Moscow for 40 days, ranting to his fellow inmates about the wonders of chess. When none of them wanted to talk or play chess anymore, he took to an unplugged telephone and claimed he was calling God to play chess with him instead. Three years later, he died. The first world titan of chess was left broken after losing the very title that made him one. And then there's Bobby Fischer, the high school dropout from Brooklyn who had symbolically challenged and brought down the unstoppable Soviet Union to become the world's 11th chess champion. When he returned home, he gave no speeches and signed no autographs. He turned down millions of dollars in sponsorship offers and locked himself away from the public eye living as a recluse. Fisher would hardly play competitive chess again, and his health, physical and mental, was slowly deteriorating. Soon, the old Fisher was hardly recognizable. He went on frequent anti-Semitic and anti-American rants. This is all wonderful news. It's time for the US to get their heads kicked in. So it's time to finish off the US once and for all. This just shows you that what goes around comes around, even for the United States. <laughs> America's chess hero had fallen. This was not an arrest. This was a kidnapping. It was all cooked up. Do you ever think about that? Yes, I do. You know, when I was watching the, the recent film about Bobby Fischer, I was thinking, you know, is this going to be me in, uh, in a few years? I don't think that's going to happen, but, you know, it made me, made me think a little bit that, you know, I have to, um, to be aware of this. Four years before Fischer's death in 2008, a 13-year-old Magnus became the youngest competitor to participate in a FIDE World Chess Championship. Magnus, with Henrik lovingly by his side, flew down to Libya for a chance to face the number one player Garry Kasparov for his title. But he didn't even get close to facing the world's number one. Because in the early rounds, he lost to Levon Aronian. That loss made the young Magnus' whole world fall apart. Now that boy was back 12 years later, dejected and fearful. He sat alone in his hotel room, knowing that he was the best, but he only had four minuscule games to prove it. The two finest chess players the world had to offer at the moment couldn't look more eerily different from each other. Sergei had a cautious, like collected confidence about him, while Magnus looks as someone who has lost everything and was manically trying to take it back. Magnus' opening fit the look, as he played the relatively new, enigmatic, and complex opening called the Archangel. In doing so, Magnus was trying to catch Sergei, who had undoubtedly studied Magnus' games religiously, off balance. But Sergei was prepared, and without missing a beat, counterattacked all of Magnus' advantages. Soon it was Magnus who was caught off guard, and on move 23 he sat there idly, digging into his precious time. In this situation when Carlson played the move knight to e7, was this another blunder? Yes. Could it cost him the game? Yes. After that, Sergei's confidence increased, and he found himself slightly holding the advantage for the next handful of moves. He even took on the offensive role, taking a pawn for his bishop. And soon, the chess engines located the possible path to victory for Sergei. But it was outrageously complicated, too much so for Sergei to see it. While the wind simply dissolved away from the imaginary battlefield, Sergei's smile did not. Game 9 would be another draw, and now he had just three more to go. Game 10 would happen on Thanksgiving Day. The crowd was bustling as spectators poured in to see if Magnus, now the underdog, could bring it back. 
Magnus has been down before, and it's precisely that reason why he's the best. He will always, no matter what, get back up. We're about to get into some crazy stuff. The world went wild. What is wrong with Magnus Carlsen? Are we literally seeing another blunder? Sergei misses an early draw opportunity, and eventually Magnus gains a slight advantage. This could be his chance. On the 56th move, Sergei cracked. Trying to gain the advantage back, he slivered his rook deep into enemy territory. But it's exactly what Magnus wanted. Like a shark smelling blood, he knew there was a winning position on the other side. He just had to find it. After 7 hours of grueling play and 75 moves completed, Sergei saw the shark in Magnus' eyes, and it was hopeless to try and swim away. Amazingly, Sergei resigns. Magnus had earned his needed win on the 10th game of a 12-game match. It was Chess's version of a borderline photo finish. As now, in Magnus' words, the two men were fighting on equal terms. Two more games to go. I wanna be the very best. Game 11, like a free no hour, 34 move tie. Sergei had white for the last time in the classical you phase, but instead of trying to win, he played defensively, test. utilizing the Roy Lopez Straight opening once again. My game 12, shockingly, there was practically the no land. audience for the last classical game of the match, as the organizers far. decided at the last minute to raise the price of attending Game 12 astronomically high, into the hundreds of dollars. I'm not a criminal. Therefore, the last that match was a ghost inside. town, and Magnus and Sergei were sitting alone in the main room, waiting to attack. And bam, just like that, an explosive 35 minute period passes. Rook's gone, knight slayed, queen's destroyed. After the fastest massacre of the whole event, a draw was decided immediately after. It was time for the football shootout-esque rapid category. Four games, 25 minutes aside each, plus an additional 10 seconds per move. If all of these four games resulted in another draw, Blitz is next, where each player only gets five minutes with an extra three seconds added per move. If players are still tied after 10 Blitz games, there's one end-all, be-all category. Never before played in a world championship, if somehow both competitors are still tied after 26 games of chess, the controversial Armageddon was designed to ensure a winner by the end of play. Whether you or your opponent get white or black is a 50-50, completely luck-based. Usually this wouldn't be a problem because almost always there is another game played after where you switch colors with your opponent. But with the Armageddon, it's just one game. It's essentially a blitz game, except whoever is the winner of white gets an additional minute of playtime. But the catch is, white needs to win. A draw in Armageddon entails black taking the game, and in turn the whole match. It's an all or nothing format that both players would love to avoid. As well as being Magnus Carlsen's birthday, November 30th would be the start of the tie-breaking phase. Four rapid games would be played back to back to back to back. More games, less time, a recipe for blunders, creativity, and the unexpected. When you don't have the time to rely on your mind, the moves become expressive in a way calculated classical chess can hardly imagine. Moves would come down to instinct and experience alone. When it came down to it, this wasn't a battle between two great minds anymore. It was a battle between two fervent hearts, put on display, palpitating for the whole world to see. You think that rapid is a good way to decide who's the best player? Well, I mean, I think you have to have, uh, you have, to have someone who wins. You have to have a way to break a tie. 12 games, it's a lot of games, so you have, you have a chance to prove that you're better. If you cannot prove, okay, you either play uh, forever or okay, you just uh, speed things up. Game 1 turns out to be a 37 move, 55 minute draw. 
Actually, and there's the draw, with the... the first game yeah. of the tiebreak ends in a draw. Onto the next. Magnus opened strong, catching Sergei off guard. Unsure how to counterattack, the Russian ate up most of his precious 25 minutes early on. And his moves, although great, were not enough to match Magnus's. Soon, wins became available to the world champion. In this position, still with a huge advantage, Carlsen should do anything that just keeps the pieces on the board. But the crowd tumbled in their seats as Magnus missed an opportunity for a win. But then he decided to trade queen and go to an angle where not, not only do the queens come off the board, but immediately another set of pieces come off the board, decreasing the chances that the miners can ever fully coordinate and now play the rook. And then another on the 73rd move by moving the wrong bishop. And that was with this horrible move bishop to g4. Might even be worth two question marks. But as long as Magnus kept on the pressure, his opponent would eventually lose by time. Soon, Sergei was down to a minute, then 30 seconds, then 10 seconds, then 5 seconds. With Sergei only having 4 seconds left on the clock, he made the draw ensuring move. Karyakin took zero time and immediately played rook to e8, preventing bishop f8 and all the fans, everybody knew something had gone wrong here for white. By the skin of his teeth, he survived game 2. The crowd, the commentators, the world was in shock. Magnus had the advantage open in the palm of his hands, and he let it fly away. The most difficult thing for Magnus in this match that he knows exactly how tough uh, Sergei is. So the tension is really growing, and maybe this is what he needs, all this tension and being a little bit scared in a positive way, so he will be able to give his best. Judith Polger, the main commentator of the tiebreaks, at her peak was ranked 8th in the world. Many male chess players didn't think a female could even make top 100, let alone top 10. The elite chess players at the time weren't convinced of Judith's abilities. World champion Garry Kasparov had gone on record saying that Judith is a trained dog. She has fantastic chess talent, but is after all a woman. No woman can sustain a prolonged battle. She will never be a great grandmaster. Instead of letting those words get into her head though, she let them in as fuel. When she found herself sitting beside Kasparov at a rapid tournament, this was her chance not only to bend his perception, but the ubiquitous collective perception of women in chess. Just like that, Judith had defeated the world champion, and Kasparov had no choice but to admit that Polgar showed that there are no inherent limitations. She had done her part of chess history and defeated the best, and now she was interested in seeing who would do the same today. Sergei, perhaps trying to take the advantage of his opponent's dejection from the previous game, opens in an uncharacteristically offensive manner. But instead of dejection, Magnus responded with surprising confidence. There was something new in his demeanor. Something that said not only I can do this, but I will do this. One and a half minute on the clock for Sergei Karyakin. I have a feeling that Magnus will win this. Karyakin. Bishop f1, rook a2, what a pressure by Magnus. I mean, it's on crazy defense, to have such win. a position again. One minute and 20 seconds left on the clock. The question is, oh. will Magnus Carlsen be able to capitalize on a winning position? We're going down to 15 seconds for Sergei Karyakin. Sergei desperately looked over the board, but all he saw was a heap of broken, uncoordinated pieces where they once stood tall. Yeah, but the thing is, the problem is that probably rook b1 is the Will only Sergei one that spend it on. First Seven, time we six. have five. And he does not play rook b1. Rook takes his seven. But rook a1, no? <laughs> so rook, I I rook a1 is the move for Magnus. Just picking up the bishop. Oh, look at that. Six, oh, wow. five, yes, four, he resides. three. Magnus won it. He resides. And Magnus Carlsen has, wins. Carlsen has won the first game of the tiebreak. And that brings us to the final game of the championship. One would expect Magnus to go on the defensive for game 4, but shockingly, his play is just as attack oriented as Sergei's. Both players are looking for a win here, as a draw is simply unacceptable at this point. But while Sergei is forced to look for a win, Magnus goes for the win none other than to prove a point, that he is chess's greatest player alive. But it's going to be tough. During the middle game, Sergei catches a break. He finds his rook and queen threatening Magnus's practically defenseless king. All the pieces that usually would defend it are eyeing an attack of their own. And soon Sergei, if Magnus plays incorrectly, has a mate in one. But Magnus sees this. He's seen it the whole time. And for 29 seconds, Magnus ponders on how to retaliate. 
and the result of this pondering delivers one of chess's greatest moves ever. In 1965, a 13-year-old Bobby Fischer had made headlines around the world for a game he played in New York's West Village. In this game, Fischer, playing as black, stunningly sacrificed his queen early in the game on the 17th move. His opponent, Donald Byrne, one of the country's best players, accepted the queen's sacrifice, thinking it a blunder by the younger opponent. It turns out that it was one of the greatest moves chess had ever witnessed. Fischer, move after move, trapped Byrne's king and took material all along the way in one of the greatest multi-move fought-out strategies ever, in what would be crowned the game of the century. Perhaps provoking the new game of the century, Magnus moves his unprotected queen right in front of Sergei's king. Whoa! What a way to finish off a world championship! Amazing combination he, by Magnus. He couldn't that capitalize. Scintillating. He couldn't wow. capitalize Simply on winning amazing. on three occasions during the match, but Magnus Carlsen bounced back, and after winning the third and the fourth game of the tie break. When two of the finest chess players in the world face off, every now and then, spectators get to witness, just for a glimpse, the secret and mysteriously alluring garden of chess. This legendary and timeless queen sacrifice is proof that, in the computer-dominated world, human ingenuity and creativity will always triumph. Magnus, with a move so sublime that it would ripple the chess world and perhaps create the spark that would light the chess renaissance to come, proved in an unfathomable fashion that he was worthy of the title of world chess champion. Magnus sees the moment, the championship, and the breathtakingly beautiful creativity of chess itself. L ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your support. Uh, I want to thank everybody. It was uh, actually a very nice atmosphere uh, during the match. Uh, I was happy to come here after after the games every day to uh, to express my feelings and uh, thank you uh, for your support for your applause and uh, still it was fun and uh, I tried uh, but now I want to uh, to get home as as my wife told me that uh, that our son he uh, he started to to make his uh, uh, you know, steps so <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> He held his head up high in the face of defeat, and it paid off. Only a month later, he would become the World Blitz chess champion, outplacing Magnus in the final round with a brilliant sacrifice of his own. And his young son, who had just learned to walk, would now be able to call his dad a multi-world champion. Magnus also had some words on fatherhood, but this time they were for his own father. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, I would like to thank my opponent again for a very good fight. I would like to thank the fans, my, my own sponsors, my chess team, my family, uh, my mother and my sisters who came here for, um, for, for a long time um, just to support me. Um, I, I, I think that's why they came anyway, not because it's uh, New York City and they wanted to shop. But, uh, and last um, but not least, um, my, my father, he, um, he's really the best support I have. He's the, he's the best person I know and he always sacrifices uh, his time and energy for me to uh, be able to perform in the best way I, I can. And he, he has done so for, um, um, well, since I, since I started to since I started to play, and I, um, I'm eternally, eternally grateful to him, even during difficult, difficult times. Uh, so, thank you very much. Um, you mean, you mean all to me.